Hi, I'm Sid. I'm the CEO and co-founder at GitLab. And today we're going to talk about hiring remote team members all around the world and remote productivity. I'm joined by Daniel. Daniel, welcome. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. So my name is Dan Azen. Uh, I currently, I just started a new company called Proof. I was previously uh, the co-founder of IEX, which is a stock exchange uh, in the same business as the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. It's the newest one. Uh, it's kind of like the good guy, underdog, uh, fair, transparent stock exchange. Uh, and I was there for about seven years and I just left to start Proof, which is kind of the same idea, but in the broker space uh, in stock trading. Um, so our customers would be mutual funds, hedge funds, trying to trade stocks, and we would be a conduit for them to get to the stock exchanges like IEX. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for having me and doing this. Yeah, thanks for your answers. Uh, so my first question for you. So one of the things, I guess, uh, in my background, IEX, it was kind of a single office, everyone in the same place, not very friendly to remote work at all. Um, but with this new company, we'd like to, you know, we're kind of inspired by you and we'd like to embrace this distributed team model. Um, and we are currently evaluating bringing on a kind of our first remote team member who's based in Canada. Uh, and so we're running into all those logistical issues with, um, you know, how to actually make that happen. So my first question is, uh, with your company, in the early days especially, what issues did you face bringing on team members around the world? Yeah. Um, we're still facing those issues. It, it isn't clear cut. Um, as you get bigger, we have now the opportunity to incorporate in more countries. We can be a traditional uh, employer there. For countries where that's still hard, we uh, sometimes hire a professional employment organization or, uh, who is the employer of record and we pay them. And sometimes people are uh, contractors. So it, there's no one one size fits all, um, and we have to continually see like, hey, where where are the areas where we uh, where we have a lot of people and maybe a nexus of business and will be a good next place to incorporate. So my next question kind of yeah goes off of that is there are all these different options like you just mentioned. Um, so when you do enter a new country, how do you make that decision of which avenue to take? Yeah, we have a, a firm that advises on us on that. What they look at is um, how many people do we have there? How much business are we doing there? What is the legal structure of that country? Like, like what are the requirements uh, by law? What is happening like um, in, in, the, in the legal system? What's, what's the, uh, what has been decided in, in recent legal cases? And then based on that, you do a risk analysis and the, the countries where it's the highest risk, we make a change. Got it. Uh, so what, what is that firm? I don't know that from the top of my head. Uh, uh, there's, there's multiple ones, but I'll, uh, I'll try to get you that. Okay. And I, how long have you been working with a firm like that? Have you been using them since the very beginning or is that a more recent development? More recent development. It costs uh, money. So in the beginning we, um, we, uh, we didn't do that. And in the beginning, you have very few people. So if you have one person working in Canada, it's less likely that there's an excess of business and all those things. So you, it will be more likely that you could still um, hire someone as a contractor or look for uh, an employer of record there. Uh, and do, you, do you have any anecdotes from the early days of kind of times you ran into challenges or you took one approach and then you quickly learned it was the wrong way to go and anything like that? Yeah. Um, surprisingly little problems. I think uh, one time we had a country where we had to provide a pension legally and we weren't aware of that. And we had to retroactively fix that. But that was, that's all the problems so far. Wow. What, has, what has been hard is like trying to treat everyone equally as, as they are team members of GitLab. Um, so for example, in our compensation calculator, if you're a contractor, you get paid 17% more to account for the, for the extra costs you make. But getting that compensation right has been one of the hardest things. So we put a lot of work in our global compensation calculator. Awesome. Um, so I had one kind of specific question to Canada because that's what we're dealing with. And I noticed that 
I love how you kind of open source everything and, and kind of list out what you use in different places. And I saw that you use CXC Global in several countries, including Canada. Do you, can you speak to kind of why you chose that path in Canada specifically? Yeah, I think that the contractor route wasn't scaling for us. So I think CXC Global is our employer of record there. Yeah, um, but did you also consider starting a subsidiary in Canada too, or was this clearly the best option? Um, we probably consider that too. That's a lot of work. So if there is a professional employment organization that has an that, that is able to do the work there and there's not a huge amount of people, we prefer that just to reduce the overhead of like running a company there and all, yeah. all the associated intercompany transfers and, and, and paperwork that comes with that. Awesome. That's super helpful. So thank you. Um, so one more question on this front. Um, which was, have you run into any issues with issuing equity or options in different countries with these different employment structures? Remarkably little. Um, we recently did an audit. Uh, we issued options, I think, in more than 40 countries. And uh, it was all, it was all okay. It was all legal. Uh, I think the hardest country is China. So if you're issuing options there, um, I would dive in a bit deeper. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, is there any other advice on this front on you know, having team members around the world that you, you have to offer? We are very proud that we gave everyone options. Um, mm -hmm. The natural thing to do is just to do them only in the US. And I think you can get away with that because people outside the US are less familiar with options. But as the options have become valuable, it would have caused a huge rift of unfairness in our company. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad we took the very hard path of issuing everyone options. Awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And we definitely plan to, to go down that path too of having every team member have a, a stake in the company. Um, okay, so on to the second topic. So, so like I said earlier, I'm used to this one office, everybody's in the same place at the same time, open floor plan, headphones discouraged. You, you know, if you want to get someone's attention, you yell across the room and you're constantly context switching. And wow. that's, that's what I've grown up in, you know, all 10 years of my career, I've worked in that environment. Um, Headphones discouraged, well, I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah. well, this is, you know, finance and, and trading specifically, where during trading hours, the market's open from 9.30 to 4 in, in the U.S. on the East Coast. Uh, you're just kind of expected to be there and 100% focused. And if someone needs your attention, it's probably urgent. Um, although that's kind of the very beginning of my career was that. And then I moved into algorithmic trading, where it's much less like that, but that culture just kind of permeates the whole area. And so, yeah, I mean, up until at, at our last company, IEX, towards the last couple of years, people started using headphones, but even that, yeah, it was, it was discouraged. Um, so, you know, that's what I'm used to. And I'm very excited about this because, you know, as a programmer in that environment, it's very difficult to get stuff done during the day. So you'd have to work on weekends or you'd have to work at night. And so this, this idea of having that, you know, much more conducive environment to productivity, uh, that's exciting, but uh, it's also totally new to me and having people not, you know, immediately there and in-person conversations being the main way to collaborate. Uh, I'm curious kind of with your experience, what tools have been the most effective for, uh, encouraging collaboration and what do you use in different situations? Yeah, so we use a lot of GitLabs, a lot of GitLab issues, a lot of um, merge requests. Um, we use Slack extensively, but it's never the system of records. So like if there's a, a meaty topic, we create an issue and are able to work on that asynchronously. I think there's still meetings, but I think they're much more focused. Every meeting has a Google Doc that uh, has like an agenda. And then as we progress through the meeting, people put their questions in there, people put their answers in them and the conclusions are put in there. So during the meeting, you build the meeting notes and they're visible for everyone. So people are much better like informed and on track of what's being decided. Got it, so it's, it's chat, but that's not a record keeping, that's just for communication. And then you said issues is one of the main ways you keep records and then, and then docs. And I guess just kind of how is company knowledge organized and yeah. Yeah, so issues is like, there's a problem, we should discuss this, create mm -hmm. an issue. And then the solution is mostly a change to our handbook, to our processes um, or to our 
to our software. Uh, so that, that ends, ends up being a merge request. And then to figure out high level things, um, where you, where you go back a few times, either in the issue or in chat or in comments on a merge request, you have this back and forth, you hop on a video call together. So we totally encourage people to hop on video calls quickly. Um, everyone has a Zoom set up. Uh, it's, it's very easy to, to, to get into one. And then if we have meetings to discuss things uh, either on a re regular basis or because something is top of mind, then they'll make sure they uh, they always have this doc attached. So today, uh, it's maybe interesting to know, we have group conversations every day. We have a portion of the company present kind of who's, who's added to the team, what, they're, what they delivered, what they're gonna work on next. And we, uh, we just made the switch today to no longer present that. So don't talk about your slides, just have people ask questions about them. And, and it's a much better format. And now probably tomorrow we're gonna to add that, hey, there we also use a Google doc where people can put in their questions and they still, they get the word, like they, they're like, hey, you're next. Um, so you still verbalize your question, but just putting it there up front helps to structure who's next with asking a question. You don't have people talking over each other and then people answering the question can kind of read ahead and, and already prepare their answer. That's cool. So sorry, can you just explain this meeting? Well, this is a daily meeting and who's presenting in it every day? So it's a different department. So sometimes it's our security department, sometimes it's finance, sometimes it's sales, sometimes it's a specific development department. It's called a group conversation. So if you Got it. go GitLab group conversation, you'll find the template and all the instructions. Um, and it's to keep people aware of what's happening in other parts of the company. Like okay. every single meeting at GitLab, it's optional. You don't have to attend. Oh, that's cool. I'm not used to that <laughs> either. Yeah, we think people are can judge their use of time. And so if they don't want to attend a meeting, they, they don't have to. There's no mandatory meetings. If the meeting is not useful to you, then great. And even if you attend a meeting, it's encouraged that if it's not relevant to you, you just go do something else while you hang out in the meeting. Oh, that's fantastic. I like that a lot. Um, so my next question on this is, do you have a process for encouraging team members to try out new productivity tools um, or for introducing new tools company-wide? Not a process as such, but we have a tools and tips section in our handbook and people regularly add new tools or new ways to do things into it. So it sounds like people are just kind of encouraged to try stuff out on their own and then if they find something useful to kind of add it to that knowledge base. Yeah, there's not a formal process for that, but yeah, people like a lot tend to be curious and tend to try new things. So yeah, that happens. Mm -hmm. Has there been kind of any? So you mentioned this kind of change to this this daily meeting, but other changes like that that have evolved over time and become kind of very honed and successful. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, um, I want to show you the change log of our handbook. So you okay. can see at what rate we're innovating. So today is the 14th. This is what happened yesterday. This is what happened the 11th. So <laughs> update the CXC Canada duration. Oh, okay. guess what? They're here. But all kinds of other things. And these are the major changes. These aren't even counting the, the commits that didn't go to a merge request. So yes, there's a lot being added to our handbook every single day. Awesome. So I guess, is the handbook something where kind of every day everyone is referencing it for something, you know, they're working on something and that's kind of just like the single place to go for how to do things? Yeah, it's a single source of truth. So very frequently, if you ask a question, someone responds with a handbook thing. And it's not meant as like, you should have read this because it's so big, no one knows everything. But it's meant like, hey, here is it. And if you have any questions after reading this, let me know. And if you think it should be different, please change it. Yeah, I mean, as someone on the outside, you know, who who only has a very small experience with GitLab, I found your your handbook to be extremely useful. Um, so thank you for making it public. Yeah, you're very welcome. And uh, if you make improvements to it, we'll, we encourage you to uh, send them back to us. So we can improve <laughs> right. our handbook too. Cool. Um, so I just have one last question. It's kind of on this um, kind of remote productivity front, but a little bit different. And it's just, like I said, I've gone from such a dramatically different work environment to, to trying this out. Uh, 
And one thing that I'm a little bit nervous about and that my partner and I are a little bit nervous about is just losing that like intense social interaction at work all the time. And, you know, most of my best friends were my coworkers and we would hang out all day at work and chit chat and then go out for drinks afterwards. And, and that was just such a large part of my life. And so going to this, this new structure where we're all over the place, uh, one big concern is just loneliness. You know, if you don't have that frequent human interaction, um, so I was just wondering kind of if that's been an issue for you or, or how you've handled it. Yeah, I think it's definitely, it's not been an issue for me, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not an individual contributor. Um, and uh, it, it is a challenge. Um, what we try to do to address it is uh, we do chit chat or call them uh, coffee, coffee chats. And it's very normal to just reserve 25 minutes with someone else and just call it a coffee chat. And there doesn't need to be an agenda. You don't necessarily have to talk about work. It's just chit chatting. And, and we encourage that. We actually, when you join, we force you to do 10 of them to get used to the idea that that's okay. Mm -hmm. Another thing we do is we encourage people to meet up in real life. Um, so there's a travel budget. Um, if, you, if you travel to meet other team members, we pay you to do that. You want to organize a meetup with the local team members, we pay for that. Uh, it goes so far as I have a house back in the Netherlands and if you want to stay there, uh, you can do that. Um, we also bring everyone together. Every nine months, we fly everyone into one location. Last one was Cape Town, South Africa. You can see a picture behind me. But yeah, there's, it's very important to kind of meet people. I'm fine with doing that uh, remote, like I like it. I think a video call with someone is just fine. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want, uh, we also pay a, a budget for like a co-working space. So if you want to hang out with other people, not necessarily your colleagues, we will pay for that too. Got it. Okay. That's great. That's all of my questions. So I guess that's it. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Awesome. This is super helpful. I appreciate it.